time is one of the things that fascinates me the most out of our natural world. The human mind has a long history with trying to understand the elusive nature of time. What it is, how to record it, how it regulates life, and whether it exists as a fundamental building block of the universe. To the ancient Greeks, time was one of the gods that created the heavens and the earth. Back then, it was thought that it couldn't be measured accurately, until mechanical clocks were invented. Then it was considered linear by Newton, meaning that we have a past, present, and future, much like we experience it to be. However, Einstein considered that time is a transmutable fourth dimension in the concept called space-time continuum. Space-time is a mathematical model that joins space and time into a single idea called a continuum, since they can't really exist without each other. If you're unfamiliar with relativity, some of these concepts may boggle your mind a little bit, but my goal is for you to walk away from this video with a better understanding of time. So I've broken down giant concepts into more savory bite sizes of knowledge that we can actually enjoy learning as we follow the bigger picture that's forming. If at some point during this video your brain feels like it's melting because of how interesting a deeper understanding of time can become, I encourage you to keep watching as I tell you about one of the greatest questions in the history of science. Today on Cognitive Culture, you'll learn about time. Is everything happening all at once? Hit the subscribe button if you like what you see so I can continue to make these happen. Time. We depend on it for everything, to coordinate our lives around every event, from cooking, to how many hours we stay at work, to the cycles of the sun, the seasons, and everything that has ever happened, from anyone being born to dying and everything in between, happens in a certain slice or coordinate of time. The concept of time seems self-evident. An hour consists of a certain number of minutes, a day of hours, and a year of days. But these words in this specific order barely scratch the surface of describing what time really is. We can't really understand something unless we know what it's made of. It would be like trying to describe a hamburger without knowing what meat or bread is. The way that I got to feel a bit closer to understanding such an extraordinary concept like time was by treating the things that happen with it like ingredients. These ingredients have helped us conclude that we could have a mild understanding about how time works. These are specifically space, motion, gravity, and entropy. Time is the ongoing sequence of events taking place, the past, present, and future. The basic unit for time is the second. There's also minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and years. We can measure time using clocks, and that's all you have to know about time. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. At least this is what we tell ourselves every day, as we live through time. We base our understanding of time on a series of occurrences, namely the sun setting. Now, in order for anything to happen, even for time to pass, there has to be a space where it took place, which means that there cannot be time without space. Or space without time. This is because space exists in each moment that passes at a precise frame within time. If I ask you to meet me for coffee at the bakery, I also have to tell you a time so we can coincide. This is what feeds into the illusion of time being real in the way that we think it is. Because if I tell you to meet me at 4 o'clock and you show up at 4 and I also get there at 4, then it's clear that we're experiencing 4 o'clock in the same way, making it a constant thing in our world and even the universe, right? Actually, not at all. Time doesn't pass the same everywhere in the universe. It doesn't even do that here on Earth. Time dilation, or the fact that it passes differently depending on where you are, takes us back to Einstein's theory of special relativity. This theory teaches us that motion through space creates alterations in the flow of time. The faster you move through the three dimensions that define physical space, the more slowly you'll be moving through the fourth dimension, time. One of the most famous experiments that served as a test for the theory of relativity was when a physicist and an astronomer took atomic clocks aboard commercial airlines. They flew these clocks twice around the world, and compared the clocks against others that remained at the United States Naval Observatory. When reunited, the three sets of clocks were found to disagree with each other, and their differences were consistent with Einstein's predictions of special and general relativity. The discrepancy between these clocks is due to time dilation. Experiments concluded since Einstein's first observations until recent times have confirmed that time does move slower for a moving object than for a stationary one. So accounting for this, if you left home to board a spaceship in the year 2000, and the spaceship went at 99% the speed of light for 5 years, when you came back, the year on Earth would not be 2005, it would be 2036. And yet, you would only be 5 years older than when you left. 
This would mean that you would have traveled into the future by 31 years. This is the same reason why the clocks inside GPS satellites, which are at such high altitudes, tick slower than the clocks on the Earth's surface. GPS accounts for this by electronically adjusting the rates of the satellite clocks, and by building mathematical corrections into the computer chips which solve for the user's location. Without the proper application of relativity, we wouldn't be able to have things like GPS. It just wouldn't work. If we were to see time as an abstract concept created to measure how things change within a parameter relative to a specific coordination, then the change relative to the parameter is caused by motion. Hence, if time doesn't exist, there would be no change happening in any space, and if motion doesn't exist, there wouldn't be a need for the concept of time. Therefore, time, space, and motion must coexist. Now, these happy three friends move on towards higher entropy, which is the next ingredient we find present during the passage of time. Entropy is understood as the degree of disorder or randomness in the universe, which is always increasing. The second law of thermodynamics states that the total entropy of a system either increases or remains constant. As one moment in time autonomously moves towards the next one, the universe almost always takes the most probable path forward. The most probable path leads to higher entropy. Time gives entropy an opportunity or necessity to rise. If entropy weren't constantly taking place, we wouldn't have a sense of time passing, so we wouldn't bother to think about it. Entropy is what gives time a purposeful direction, an arrow, called the arrow of time. Time's arrow moves in one direction, coming from the past, moving from the present into the future. Like eggs that might spontaneously break, but they would never spontaneously reform again. Now what's interesting is that there's nothing in the laws of physics that states that time should move forward in the direction that we know. The laws of physics are symmetric, ultimately meaning that time could have easily moved in a backward direction as it does forward. And this is what would give way to all periods of time happening at the same time. To understand this in a simple way, it's useful to look at time as if it were a movie. When watching a movie, we can't see every frame at once. Instead, we watch it pass by in the order that it's been presented to us. But the movie as a whole still exists before you watch it and will continue to exist after you're not watching it. The complexity of why we interpret time in a forward motion has led scientists to question why. Inevitably, some have concluded that time is simply a human construct. It looks like our biological brains turn everything into some kind of story in order to understand it, a linear series of events. Again, like a film strip in which the beginning, middle, and end are all present, but each picture on the strip stands independently. Yet, if you look at these pictures in a particular order, it'll look like someone's living a life. Another good example of time not being the same for all things that exist is that time passes differently for different species. And this happens right here, in the same Earth that we're all experiencing. Studies have found that time passes more slowly for flies. And flies are not alone in their ability to perceive time differently from us. Research suggests that across a wide range of species, time perception is directly related to size. Generally, the smaller the animal is, the faster its metabolic rate, which means that the slower time passes for it. This makes a lot of sense if you think about how quickly flies and mosquitoes move when we try to swat them. For us, it takes less than a second for us to move our hand, but for them, it's experienced in slow motion, so they're able to take off before we even get close. While relativity happens on Earth all the time, the differences are so small that they're imperceptible. However, if two observers are separated by enough distance, say tens of billions of light years, their movement can change their perception of the frame to include events in our past or in our future. But if this is true, and our future or our past can be part of the perception of another observer, that must lead us to the conclusion that past, present, and future already exist. Ultimately, this would mean that the future is not unfolding and that the past is not inaccessible. MIT physicist Max Tegmark told Space.com, We can portray a reality as either a three-dimensional place where stuff happens over time, or a four-dimensional place where nothing happens. This second idea is called block universe. Block universe theory, which is backed up by Einstein's theory of relativity, states that space and time are part of a four-dimensional structure where everything that has happened has its own coordinates in space-time. This would allow everything to be technically real, in a sense that the past and even the future are still there in space-time. According to relativity, the perception of a now, and particularly a now that moves along in time so it appears to flow, arises purely as a result of human consciousness and the way that our brains are wired. Perhaps as an evolutionary tool to help us deal with the world around us, even if it doesn't actually reflect reality. 
much like our interpretation of color, for example. Color is a function of the human visual system. It's not an intrinsic property. Objects don't have a color. They give off a light that appears to be a color once we look at it. As Einstein once remarked, people like us who believe in physics know that the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. Now, this illusion is because of our human phaneron. The phaneron is essentially the real world filtered by our sensory input. Sight, hearing, touch, and every other sense that we experience is our interpretation of things that are happening. Not to be thought of as a filter necessarily, but as the actual mental construct of the world that's believed to be by an individual, apart from actual reality. For example, dogs have a different phaneron from us. Dogs can take in visual information at least 25% faster than humans, which is just enough to make a TV show look like a series of flickering images. If time does exist all at once and it's not linear in the order that we experience it to be, then this means that there's very little chance to us ever finding out the absolute truth about time because of our phaneron. It's what limits the kinds of realities that we can experience. We're only capable of experiencing reality from the point of view of a person because that's what we are. And so everything we know about the world has been concluded based on our physical and mental capabilities and limits to process everything around us. Meaning that there are things that are just not within reach for us to ever understand as they really are. We can't see things like gravity, but we know it's here. Speaking of which, now we know that space, time, motion, and entropy are all dependent of each other. But what about gravity? Well, under Einstein's theory of general relativity, gravity can kind of curve time. Think of space-time as a piece of fabric. When anything that has mass sits on top of that piece of fabric, it causes a dimple or a bending of space-time, which would be just the curvature of the fabric. The bending of space-time causes objects to move on a curved path, and that curvature of space is what we know as gravity. Gravity is what allows for life as we know it, our day and night cycle, curved starlight, our planets and stars, and even time travel. Just that we don't really understand that last part yet, maybe one day that we can't see from now very far away, but right now we, we're no, it's, we're not close, we cannot time travel, we've tried. Whether or not Einstein's theory of gravity will remain unchanged is not known, but it has produced many unexpected, unintuitive predictions that have been confirmed again and again for over a hundred years. And that's the sign of a great scientific theory. It makes predictions that may not be able to be proven at the time, but stand up to rigorous testing. Obtaining a true understanding of time has been one of the greatest journeys in the history of science, involving not just Newton and Einstein, but thinkers and doers all around the world who have put these theories to the test. The idea of a universe in which all events exist simultaneously is both a grim and a comforting one. This would mean that things and people that we've lost aren't really gone, they're just out of reach at the moment. But it might also mean that we might not have as much say in the future as we think we do. Out of all the things we can do with time, it seems like there's one that we just haven't managed yet, and that's to really understand it. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know in the comments what you think time is. And if you'd like a part two of this video, also let me know so we can talk about why time is different in our dreams and why we seem to be convinced that life flashes before our eyes before we die. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up so I can know what kinds of videos you'd like to see more of. As I hope you noticed, you didn't experience any ads in this video, and that's because I've demonetized my channel so that it doesn't show ads anymore. This way, I feel more connected with the message that I'm delivering, and I can attempt to just provide value, which is my intention. Almost four months ago, I left my job so that I can make videos full-time, and with that, I had to leave the United States so that I can afford to live humbly. If you would like to support my channel so I can continue to exist and make more videos and also make them more frequently, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I've designed really cool packages where you can vote on my next video topic, have existential talks with me, and much more. To visit my Patreon, click on the link on the top right of the screen or go to patreon.com forward slash cognitive culture. You can also click on the orange button that'll show up in the middle of the screen at the very end of this video. Here's an incredibly special thanks to my Patreons, Mike, Jenny, Gabriel, Nadia, Edwin, Johnny, Chris, Elizabeth, Elvis, Rosie, Peter, Mark, Peter Lawrence, and everyone else that's contributed to other packages. You can find your names in the description of this video. Cheers.